I'm going to take a moment now. I'm going to listen to this tape. I'm going to listen to a little bit of this tape, and I want you to listen and watch, and I want you to notice the change in Malcolm. Last week, I told you, you can notice the change in Malcolm by the rhetoric and by his, his beard. So I want you to start listening to the change in the rhetoric of, of Malcolm, see if you can detect it. Um, you can watch this for a few moments. I'm going to stop it, make some comments, and then later on we're going to come back to the tape again, okay? Anybody got any questions before I show the tape? Yes. was less militant. Yes. So um, when Malcolm was with the NOI versus when Malcolm leaves the NO, uh, NOI? Good question. Okay. That's an excellent question. That is, a, make sure you bring that. That is a really profound question. Because one of the things that you will notice, uh, if we're honest about the life of Malcolm, is that this man was in, a con especially the last year of his life, was in a constant state of transition. Really, he was all over the place. And, and, and some might argue that your guess is as good as mine in terms of Malcolm, where he was going. And, and you, when we talk about the lessons of, of Malcolm according to Quran and Sunnah, you will see that when you have great people, everybody likes to claim them. I'll give an example. Which groups of people do you think right now lay claim to Malcolm? Name some of the groups. Socialists, socialists good. Socialists will swear that Malcolm was a socialist. They'll swear on it. And they'll give you good evidence. They'll give, if you ask them for Dalil, if you ask them for evidence, they'll say, boom, this is the last speech, boom. And you know what? They'll be right in terms of their claim based upon the evidence that they give. Absolutely. That's a really magnificent point. Who else claims them? Nationalists. Black nationalists. No, Malcolm was a nationalist. And if you ask for evidence, you give body evidence. And, and they will give you, they will give you um, both pre-1964, right, and post-1964, even after he became an Orthodox Muslim. They said, no, Malcolm was a, uh, you know, he was a nationalist. Who else claims them? No, no, not, well, well, the nation to a sense because th they will say, and you see, some of us get, and I heard it last week, is like, yo, man, really, what, what converted Malcolm wasn't Sunni, Sunni Islam. It wasn't normative Islam. It was the nation of Islam. It wasn't normative Islam. It wasn't Sunni Muslims that, that converted him in prison turn his life around. We would like to say that. Now, we in public, we say, yeah, it was Islam, say Malcolm. Well, okay, but let's, let's explain it. So, so, so Muslims, so, so, so uh, Nation of Islam is not a bad point. They claim him. Who else claims him? The Muslims. I would argue that the Muslims, uh, in my opinion, have claimed him less than anyone else, which is a mistake. This man, is a, this man is a hero. Af Malcolm, he's not only a national hero, he's an international hero. This man is loved and respected all over. And, um, and, and, and you can tell by how many, how many books written about Malcolm. Unbelievable. I mean, there are probably at least 100 books written about Malcolm, at least. 100 books and I don't know how many countless essays about the life of Malcolm. This man is profound. Whatever you think about him, I'll tell you one thing, he affected a lot of, a lot of folks. A lot of folks respected him. I remember, I remember what he was saying about um, the conditions in Africa, the decolonization period in Africa, and how the Africans in, in Asia also were looking at the African American condition. And I think I remember him in a speech or an interview saying that they were, the, the world was looking at us to see what we would do to see how they would then carry their decolonization you process. You know, uh, Talib's making a very interesting point because I, I would argue. You know, and you can challenge me if you want. One of my arguments is that I believe that the world is looking at the Muslims in America the same way they were looking at the African Americans during the time of Malcolm to see what we're going to do here. I don't think that we're here in America by accident. I think the Muslims in America all over the world who come here are here for a reason. I think with the indigenous uh, African American community, indigenous Hispanic community, indigenous white European American community, as well as those Muslims who migrated to this country, migrate in this country for a reason. 
I believe, and I'm, this is you and I talking, I'm not trying to get no brownie points with nobody. I think America is the greatest, the greatest nation on this earth. And I'm going to tell you why I think it's the greatest nation on earth and, and why I think most people in the world think it's the greatest nation on the earth. And, and then, then what then does that mean for us? What should we be doing? If Allah brought us here to be in the greatest nation on the earth at this time, then what are we supposed to be doing? I would argue that we, we have failed miserably as a group because we're not doing the mandate. And I would also argue that Malcolm did more with little, Malcolm Little, than we did with much. He did what, he did what and, and you will see how little he had compared to what we have. And look what he did with that little. Yeah. So uh, that's excellent. Who else claims Malcolm? I'm sorry, before we continue, um, you said Malcolm did a lot with little, but um, I, I mean, having little, doesn't that push people to do more? And like you said, we're more privileged, and isn't that in a sense hindering us from doing something? Not inherently in hindrance. It's up to us. I think that, that you, you could argue, I have, a, I have an argument for that. Um, I would rather have more and do more with what we have. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's, um, um, it's a cop out to suggest that we not we not doing more because we got too much. We got too much knowledge. We got too much ilm. This is is, is is crazy. We got too much truth. No man, he had a the nation of Islam had a glimmer of truth. They had the name Islam. They didn't have Islam. They had the name Islam, but yet look what they accomplished. And that's what we're going to talk about in terms of the lessons so that we can extract from those lessons and leave here today with a commitment, a firm commitment to do something. You, you, you got me? Who was the last people that claimed Malcolm? We, got, we said the nationalists. We said the, the Sunni Muslims, socialists, the, the Orthodox Muslims, Sunni, and the Nation of Islam, and one other group. Mm -mm. No, not the Christians. No, 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 not the Christians. There's one more group. He was called, if you read some of the books about Malcolm, they, they claim, they call him the revolutionary. He was a revolutionary, a radical, even a radical. Um, not communist, though, though communists would claim him too. And, and by the way, by the way, by the way, I'm going to tell you who also claimed him. You're not going to believe me. You said, no, Imam, you're making this up. I'm not making it up. No, no, not the Jews. No, no. Mm -mm. No, the who? The who? No. Mm -mm. No, no. That's, that's, that's good, man. You know who claimed them? You're not going to believe this. Huh? No, they didn't say, well, Malcolm is really white, you know. No, not white people. No, no, not the people. Huh? It is so. It is so outrageous. You you and guess is this too, huh? Anarchist? No, no, not anarchist. But that's that's a good that's a good not atheist. No. <laughs> yalla yalla, huh? Homosexuals. Wow. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. By any means necessary, right? <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you what they did. Let me tell you what they. You got this guy got a lot of stuff on him, you know. You got to listen to him. He's 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 up there. Uh, you know what they'll do? They actually go, they'll go to your past, and they grab something out of your past. And one of the things about Malcolm is that on the one hand, you know, in general, the general principle in Islam is whatever um, bad habits you had in the dunya, you don't you don't discuss them. That's the general principle. What what Malcolm did though is maybe he's a little bit unique because his life is Dawah itself. And I think in a, in, a, in a real sense, what Malcolm did before he became Muslim is good to know because to see the transformation, I think, was, which is a good point. But maybe there's some things he did when he was like dirty red that you don't want to necessarily know about. And then flight 115 from Cairo, arriving 425. Passengers now unloading at gate 6. Malcolm, have your experiences with uh, white-skinned Muslims in uh, Africa and the Middle East made you feel that uh, relations between Negroes and whites who are not Muslims is any more possible? 
when I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who were themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done this, done that for them, perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps it could do the same thing for him. At Jeddah in Saudi Arabia on the way to Mecca, I remember the ancient words of Allah. Proclaim the pilgrimage among men. They will come on foot and upon lean camel. They will come from every deep ravine. From Mecca, the holy city of Islam, I wrote to friends in America. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and true brotherhood as is practiced here in this ancient holy land, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all the other prophets of the holy scriptures. You may be shocked at these words coming from me, but what I have seen has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held, to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. For during the past 11 days, I've eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, slept on the same rug, and prayed to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. We are truly the same because their belief in one God has removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from their attitudes. Wearing the Iram garb of a pilgrim, I made the seven circuits around the Kaaba. I drank from the sacred well of Zemzem. I ran between the hills of Safa and Marwa. I stood on Mount Ararat and with my brothers proclaimed, I come, O Lord, I come. God is great. Lead us, O Lord, in peace. And for the first time in my 39 years on this earth, I stood before the creator of all and felt like a complete human being. Sincerely, El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X. I think a lot of people are confused by the new Arabic name, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. This is always, I've always uh, had the name on my passport, Malik uh, El Shabazz, only I only used it in the Muslim world. Well, Hajj is a title that is given to any Muslim who makes the pilgrimage to Mecca during the official Hajj season. Well, are you, will you now use Shabazz and drop X? I'll probably continue to use Malcolm X because, and I'll probably use it as long as the situation that produced it exists. <laughs> we, you don't feel, you don't feel that Shabazz takes the place of X. Uh, uh, my going to Mecca and going into the Muslim world, into the African world, and being recognized and accepted as a Muslim and as a brother uh, may solve the problem for me personally. But I uh, personally feel that my personal problem is never solved as long as the problem is not solved for all of our people in this country. So I remain Malcolm X as long as there is a need to protest and struggle and fight against the injustices that our people are involved in in this country. Are you prepared to go into the United Nations at this point and ask that charges be brought against the United States for its treatment of American Negroes? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Please. I think you're right in my opinion. The audience will have to be quiet. <laughs> uh, yes, the, as I pointed out when I was in, during my traveling, that nations look, African nations and Asian nations and Latin American nations look very hypocritical when they stand up in the United Nations condemning the racist practices of South Africa and that which is practiced by Portugal and Angola and saying nothing in the UN about the racist practices uh, that are, that are uh, manifest every day against Negroes in this society. Even in South Africa, those Africans uh, aren't faced with bayonets and aren't faced with police dogs. I, I would be not a man.
If I was in a position to bring it in front of the United Nations and didn't do so, I wouldn't be a man. Malcolm, do you intend to lead the charge uh, in the United Nations? Well, I, I find that to say you're going to lead something creates a lot of hostility, division, jealousy, and envy. Uh, I hope to, to work with any group of leaders or any group of organizations to do whatever is necessary to see that this problem is brought before the United Nations. Have you had any commitment from any nations in Africa to support your I move? I would rather not say at this time, but one thing I found in my travels, all of them look at, upon us as their long-lost brother. You realize the implication is that you have had such commitments when you say... This is you your interpretation of what I said. <laughs> uh, 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 thing that I found in all of my travels was that uh, all of the Africans, not only the Africans, but the Asians and the Muslims, look upon us as their long-lost brothers. And America had actually tricked many of them uh, into uh, a hands-off policy by giving them the impression that she was honestly trying to do something to solve the problem. My argument over there was designed to prove that it is impossible for the United States government to solve the race problem. It's impossible. Malcolm, on your trip abroad, you said you sent a feeling of great brotherhood and that conceivably you would be working toward integration in this country now. At least this is what you're reported to have said. Have you any comment on it? I don't think that I ever uh, mentioned anything about working toward integration. They haven't even got integration right here in New York City. You have worse integration problems in the North than they have in the South. So if it doesn't work, in, if, if you can't bring about integration in New York City, as international, cosmopolitan, up-to-date as it's supposed to be, you will never get integration anywhere else in the country. Are you prepared to work with some of the leaders of the other civil rights organizations? Certainly. Certainly. We will work with any uh, groups, organizations, or leaders in any way, as long as it's genuinely designed to get results. Does your new beard have any religious significance? No, not particularly, but I do think that you find black people uh, in America as they strive to throw off the shackles of, of uh, mental colonialism will also probably reflect a, a, an effort to, show, to, to uh, throw off the shackles of uh, cultural colonialism. And they may begin to reflect desires of their own with standards of their own. Uh, Malcolm, the more controversial remarks was uh, a call for black people to get rifles and form rifle clubs sometime back. Do you still favor that for uh, self-defense? I, I don't see why that should be controversial. I think that if white people found themselves the victim of the same kind of brutality that black people in this country face, and they saw that the government was either unwilling or unable to protect them, that the intelligence on the part of the whites would make them get some rifles and shotguns and protect themselves. Now, Negroes are developing some kind of intellectual maturity, too. And they can see that by having waited upon the government to protect them has been a, a wait that has been uh, in vain. So uh, any of them who live in areas where the government is not able to do its job, then we do have to get together and do a job of protecting ourselves. No Negro leaders have fought for civil rights. What do you mean they by They have fought? begged for civil rights. They have begged the white man for civil rights. They have begged the white man for freedom. And every time, anytime you beg another man to set you free, you will never be free. Freedom is something that you have to do for yourselves. And until the American Negro lets the white man know that we are really, really ready and willing to pay the price that is necessary for freedom, our people will always be walking around here second-class citizens or what you call 20th century slaves. Number one, sister, let me ask you a question. Was Malcolm a threat? And to whom was he a threat? if he was. Was Malcolm a threat? Give me your name again. Harun. Harun. Um, a better question would be... Or just adding on to that question, um, was Malcolm more of a threat when he first joined the Nation of Islam? I don't want to ask that question yet. No? No, that's a good question, but I don't want to ask that question yet. Um, give me your view of, of Malcolm. Was Malcolm a threat? And if yes, to whom? If Malcolm was a threat, to whom? First of all, let me ask you a question. Do the math. How old was Malcolm when he was assassinated? Just short of his 40th birthday. How old was this man, Martin Luther King Jr.? How old was he when he was assassinated? 39, short of his 40th birthday. 
is there any significance to the number 40? How old was Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, when he, re when he received messengership? He was 40 years old. And the Quran mentions that year, 40 years. Uh, until they reached the age of full strength. And, to, and, then, and they reached the age of 40. 40 is a significant number. Now, most of you in this room are not yet 40. There's a couple of you, I can tell. So, some of you are fast approaching. Some of them passed it already. I won't, I won't tell. But Martin Luther King threat. Why? Who believes that Malcolm was a threat to somebody? Raise your hand. How long you're not sure? There's some ambiguity in you. Yeah, I can see it. There's some hesitancy. I believe they were both a threat. Um, just like the, or, or rather, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was a threat to the the people in in the area. And a threat, perceived threat. No, not a perceived threat. An actual threat. Okay. So then who were the people? Anyone in power, anyone who had supremacy or said supremacy over... But why, why, what is it about Malcolm? Why Malcolm? Why Malcolm? Why Malcolm, Fatima? Because he could build a following, uh, he had a following, a strong following already. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Because he had a strong following already. What do you mean by a strong following? You tell me, Sister Fatima. I mean, uh, Malcolm started two institutions. Because if you're going to be successful, you need more than rhetoric. You need more than charisma. You need more than articulation. You need more than ability to rap. You need institutions.